Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science and Technology. In today's show, Camera Tuesday, we're going to talk about a Nikon Z50 Mark II. So let's dive deep into it. So this puppy Z50 Mark II, it's updated version of an entry-level APS-C camera, meaning this camera from Nikon's point of view is basically the first interchangeable lens camera that you buy once you want to upgrade from mobile phone. You eventually would go to flagship, but this would be a starting point where you, you know, get things rolling. You're not supposed to use these for professional paid suit because again, it does not even have dual card slots. So again, from Nikon's point of view, this is an entry-level APS-C as in cropped sensor system. Now it has a lot of improvement from five years ago compared to Z50 mark one and uh, the sensor is not something that changed the sensor is exactly the same as it has been for almost past eight years so you're like what's the point well uh, you have to understand sensor is generally not the weak link uh, the soc is so nikon did not made amazing strides when they launched their uh, basically mirrorless lineup because their on sensor auto focusing was not that good it took them till xpeed 7 when they were like yeah now we are at the big league so this time you get that xpeed 7 autofocus on something that is on entry level so that is a very big jump compared to z50 mark 1. Now flip out screen rather than flip down screen, which uh, I have no idea what they were smoking when they were like, what if, if the screen went down? I'm like, what if you thought that there is a something known as tripod? <laughs> this does not make any sense. How the heck it went through from a, like, you know, product design to actual product is beyond me, but it was stupid and they fixed it. So now it has a proper normal flip side screen. Again, even if it was flip up, it would have made sense. Flip down, what the hell? Uh, so... It is what it is and the price supposed to be $910, not a very cheap camera and in India while I'm recording this video it's around $78,000 in IM student uh, although the, uh, they are showing out of stock for a brand new camera which is not even available in most places so I'm like huh so that's the minimum price I'm reasonably sure it will be above this so it's not a very cheap camera but is there and it has class leading electronic viewfinder while you can get stuff from sony and canon many of them does not have evf electronic viewfinder now you have to understand the reason why it is mandatory in this sort of camera is because the lcd that is used here is of ancient technology so it's useless in sunlight so at the moment you go in broad daylight and you're like okay i need to see you can't see even if your mobile phone oleds can go so bright that you can see in broad daylight this cannot so at that point you need evf Basically, you should not need EVF, but we needed EVF because the LCD is garbage. But again, at least they understand the limitation and they have it and they have upgraded it. Basically, from Mark 1 to Mark 2, it's twice as bright. So you can see far more uh, true to life, quote unquote, feeling of it. So there is a lot of improvement like this. And the ergonomics has been refined, whatever that means. So this is Z50 Mark 2. So what the specs? Well, the specs is uh, not that grand, so to say, 20 megapixel, it's not 24 even. So 20 megapixel DX CMOX sensor, nothing uh, interesting, but XP7, this puppy, that's the whole point. It has 3D tracking autofocus, which again, uh, Nikon was known for during DSLR days because they were really good. Not just like, oh, no, it was good. So they're doing good stuff and they have subject recognition, meaning it can understand what it's trying to target, train, uh, automobile, birds, dogs, things of that nature. So that's a quite a big step up from um, cheap options. Actually, you could even had a Xpeed 6 flagship camera, it would be outperformed by this puppy. That was a big jump going from Xpeed 7, uh, basically Xpeed 6 to Xpeed 7. It has single UHS 2 slot, so you can actually get a um, utilized high speed card allow your buffer to clear very quickly so that's there USB-C charging because for this model they are no longer giving you the battery caddy you're supposed to charge it exactly like a smartphone again that has its own pros and cons but if you are expecting to travel with this sort of camera I would urge you to buy a third-party uh, battery charger where you have like you know two USB-C uh, side dock charging that will make your life easier and then because they are directly targeting people who are not have a giant pipeline pre-built meaning uh, I take a photo from this uh, DSLR it captures in raw i send the raw into the lightroom then i process it then i have the final output then i share it yeah that's a complete pipeline now again it's a that pipeline is uh, normal for photographers but people who are just jumping into it it's too much hassle so for those people they are like hey we have jpeg plus raw and in the jpeg you can have your own creative picture control now be mindful all cameras more or less have this nikon has just made it easier to employ and deploy and not to mention you can also collaborate for example there are some better photographer who understand this sort of digital processing better than you and they're like hey i have made this you may enjoy it in a rainy season you have downloaded that uh, quote unquote LUT into this and you take it and you may like it you may not like it and again there's a whole marketplace of it again most of them are free so 
you can go yolo on it and it's specifically made so it's easy to use you can even use them in video uh, although there is no rob fallback in a video but you can use it so that's there and mechanical uh, shutter speed is kind of decent 11 frame per second and electronic is a bit high 30 fps now be mindful the moment you go to 30 fps it does not do raw again it at this sort of price range is almost all cameras have this whereas like electronic super awesome speed yeah it just drops to jpeg no raw so that's there all those are like and again it also has like you know headphone out which is a very big upgrade for people who want to do video because while almost all cameras even my ancient uh, canon 800d has mic in very few very few has headphone out they have headphone out now because these cameras never upgraded from 1990s they do not know of bluetooth you can use your bluetooth headset which again mind you all action cameras have already figured out so someday they will reach into the year 2000 let's hope so but again at least for old people it has that old option it's like use a headphone so that's there and it has a uh, pre-buffer now you might uh, be mindful if you're never seen a scene in a high-speed camera it's always recording meaning you set up a high-speed camera you trigger it it's recording then how do you capture it well you don't it just captures everything into ram and then keeps deleting on the last moment so it's like arm it's doing that it's going into ram and it's deleting everything once it overflows so whenever you had your scene like Whatever the scene happened, you press the trigger, then it saves last one second. So same thing is happening here. Now, this is not a new thing. This has been available in Nikon's flagship, Canon, a lot of Canon cameras and some Sony cameras also. And this is the next generation because our uh, flash chips and uh, RAM chips are fast enough that this can be done. Meaning half press, it starts to take photo and as high as 30 frame per second, meaning 30 shots are getting buffered into the RAM and you see like so basically, if, you, if a bird is coming down, you just half press it. The moment it crosses the water boundary, then you're like, press it. One second before that would be saved into your memory. Then you're like, awesome. Now you can look through. So it's a really useful thing for certain niche cases where they're like short of tech money. This is like, this is something that is genuinely current generation. It was not even imaginable with a DSLR. So this is something significant. And again, other cameras had that. It's unique that uh, Nikon entry level APS-C is getting this. So what about the video? Well, video, it has no longer the 30 minute limit, but for some reason it has that two hour limit. I have seen way too many Nikon's camera that have two hour limit. I do not know why it may be exceeds uh, inherent limitation, but more than good enough because be mindful, more likely you are to run out of battery or card filling up. So that's okay. But again, 30 minute limit was because of Euro European Union weed smoking and they were like okay that's why my camera has 30 minute limit thankfully they revoked it a few years ago so now all cameras can record more than 30 so that's there again they would have charged you like a video camera higher tax bracket that's why companies had to keep at 29.59 it has proper usb webcam support which again its previous version could act as a webcam but you have to go through uh, nikon custom software and all that jazz now it's just like plonk it in done default uh, uh, you know webcam protocol so that's a really good add-on Product review for showcase, again, if you are all about that influencer life, you can go YOLO on it. For most people, it's not that unique. And be mindful that truly, uh, to get the, the true effect you need, uh, you may need a very large aperture, like f1.2 or something like that. Because again, this is an APS-C system. So achieving that sort of vibe with f4, actual f4 is like not that wow. So you do need expensive lens to truly justify that. But it's there and it can do 4k 30 fps and 60 but be mindful the moment you go to 60 it does crop on a crop sensor yeah that's not awesome that's not awesome me not cool with that that's not awesome however because again the xp7 it can do n log and 10 bit in uh, inbuilt recording now be mindful because nikon has already consumed a red so they can give you a log file that uh, decodes your camera footage to look like a red camera it has a similar vibe to so that's there. And for people who are serious about video, it has a live waveform monitoring, which basically is this puppy because again, LCD screens that are uh, on the back of the cameras are useless. So waveform is kind of compulsory because again, it removes the ambiguity of uh, ambient light. So your uh, how your ambient lighting is affecting this, how you are perceiving it can be bypassed. Now it's like, okay, is I'm clipping or not clipping? That's it. So for many serious videographer, that's like very good. And it is a really, pro level tool which is that's how all cinema works so having that tool here is a good thing it also has a pop-up flash and a tele light so there are a lot of things uh, that make uh, videographers life easy and yes you can do that videographer thing where it's like you know you have picture profile so you can directly cut it and send it to uh, instagram or things of that nature so quite competent in video uh, market so to say 
So question is for whom? Well, there is one penalty given the fact that the sensor is eight years old. It does not have the fastest readout. It does not have rolling, uh, basically modern generations of rolling shutter improvement. So a rolling shutter, if you basically take the camera and do like this whip pan or you are capturing, trying to capture something while you are moving. Yeah, you'll be like, no, it will look like old. Like the footage will look old. So yeah, in 2024, eight years ago, it's like uh, long ago. So yeah, you will notice it. And because it does not have IBUS for this sort of price, yeah, that part is like, no. So now you will have jello effect from the rolling shutter and the fact that you do not have IBUS, so you will have extra motion blur. Yeah, that could make things uh, poop for uh, run and gun type shooting. Meaning if you are putting your camera on a tripod and like how I'm doing, go YOLO on it, you're going to have fun time. But if you're like, hey, I'm going to put it on a handle, I'm going to do selfie vlogging with it. Yeah, no, no. You're like what about electronic shot? No, trust me. The, the, the best image stabilization is a combo image stabilization where you have lens elements moving in an x y coordinate basically two dimensions like this and then you have ibus moving in five dimensions basically x y z motions and then it also has rotation tilt and all this so that way it can compensate for far more thing and if these two physical emotion systems are working together with each other like in case of panasonic you can achieve butter like basically you can do handheld photography at 900 millimeters, which people have been doing that with uh, like, you know, micro four third. It can be done because again, if lens image stabilization and sensor image stabilization are working together, you're going to get butter out of it. So that's the optimum scenario. Suboptimum is having IBUS because IBUS rotates. The image in plane rotates. So any, this sort of motion can be canceled out. You cannot do that on sensor. You cannot rotate a lens. It won't affect anything. So you want image stabilization in sensor. Second option is in lens. Uh, the best option is having in both of them here because you do not have ibus and if you are like many people who used to buy hey i'm gonna buy a low-end camera but i'm gonna buy quality lens because again lens do last very long time so you're like hey i'm gonna invest in lens let's say you bought a 50 millimeter 1.8 uh, lens it's a full frame lens very quality optics you're gonna have amazing portraiture with this puppy yeah it does not have image stabilization so yeah that's gonna have an effect and then you're like okay 70, uh, 24 to 70 f 2.8 Again, very quality, holy trinity lens. Does not have image stabilization. So you're like, yeah. So that part is something very considering. Because again, if Canon uh, Nikon was like, okay, all our sensors have IBUS, then we are removing it, it made sense. But now you can put this lens, but you will get very weird results. So, <coughs> so that output is not good. Now, thankfully, at least all the APS-C lens, they do have IBUS. But penalty is now they are expensive. So that part is like, hmm. Mogambo is not happy. So that part is not great. So be very mindful, especially for people who are planning to buy a full frame lens, this entry level body, which again, it was a very common thing in back in the old days of Nikon D3100. It was the old uh, common way of doing things. It can't be. And in terms of photography, it's a great camera for a starter system. You can have good fun with it. In terms of video, it's also very good. Although the cropping in 60 FPS is really annoying because it's already cropped. So it's like, crop 50 mm to like you know okay 1.5x now you crop it again it's like brah you literally dropped it to micro four third so that may annoy people and it cost is good but it's too goddamn close to full frame and this is odd thing to me in this modern time because when i was like looking into cameras back in the old days of like seven eight years ago there was a very giant difference between APS-C camera and full frame camera like in that currency it was like thirty five thousand to twenty five thousand for like a you know uh, APS-C camera, Nikon D3100, and then you had to pay lakhs to get full frame. Now you are paying almost lakhs for uh, like APS-C, then what's the point? Yes, full frame are more expensive, but again, ironically, lenses are cheaper because again, they are far more mass produced. And the moment you go into third party, it's like, whoa. So, and that's why you will find third party APS-C lens that are quality lens. They are so expensive. They are like almost the same price as full frame. And be mindful, there is what about weight and all that. Yeah, you'll be shocked. Because again, full frames are used by people who have money. So they are generally go through far more optical refinement than you would think. And the quality is generally good. The only place where you can have crop sensor and still quality lens are cinema lenses. And those are even more expensive. So fundamentally, that's why I'm not that comfortable nowadays with APS-C cameras. Because again, if it was a very giant gap between the uh, entry level full frame versus uh, like, you know, maximum APS-C, it was a clear cut case for APS-C to exist. Nowadays, it's like APS-C is almost touching. It's almost touching the price of a brand new full frame from a good brand, be it Nikon, be it Sony, be it Canon. Canon has some really good options. It has 4K 60 without crop. The only penalty there is like you cannot get third party lenses. Yes, Canon does not allow third party lenses if you are using full frame. They have tricked people and their atten limited attention span because we have unlocked it. No, you only unlocked it for APS-C. So.
that's the penalty but canon has really good options for a starter sort of camera which is reasonable price so that's the part where i'm not very comfortable with this sort of camera it's expensive if it was cheap it was like hey you know it's expensive and you do not even have ibus if that means if i buy these sort of lenses i have to be very limited <clears throat> So you may find this camera to be good to meh, that's up to you, I mean, depending what matters for you. But be very mindful, please look into full frame offerings from all brands. You may be shocked how close this puppy gets. So this was my presentation on a Z50 Mark II. Hopefully you have liked it, learned from it. In that case, please hit the like button, share it with your friend, that will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike, press it twice to show me extra disappointment. Please leave a comment because I do try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you're free, and as always, thanks for watching.